wonderful to be in Keene Mountain today. And uh, I, I, I didn't come just for the food either. Somebody stopped me up the aisle just now, so that's why they came. <laughs> just want you to know that as you're on your way to the pulpit. I didn't even come, Brother Jeff, for chocolate chocolate chip pound cake, but it does help. Some good stuff there. Brother Randy's saying we're here, you know, no no time constraint and all that. I said, well, I know people better than that. Sunday night, choir at home was singing, I'm going to view that holy city one of these days. And they were shouting, jumping around there. And it was one of the, one of the lines was, I'm going to sing and never get tired one of these days. And they were all, you know, going on over that. And so I got to the pulpit. I said, boy, I'm looking forward to that day, that day where I can preach and never get tired. I didn't, get, I didn't get any amens on that one. So I've not got there yet. You don't have to worry about it. I'm going to I'll preach a while and get tired. But I want the Lord to help us today. Appreciate the service last night. I'd like to see a, a response better. But that's part of the day we're living in. It really is. But uh, I'm going to be reading Acts chapter number 20, Philippians chapter number 3, and 2 Timothy chapter number 4, just a verse or so in each spot today. I'll try not to be very long and get Brother Barnett here. And I love I love these preachers. Brother Barnett, I just uh, I've told folks here, I said he's he's a legend in his own time. He's a prince with God. And I'm so glad that I've gotten to sit and be influenced under these ministries. Acts chapter number twenty, verse number twenty four. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. I want you to get this. So that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So that I might Finish my course. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. You can probably quote it. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7. Again, it's probably one that's so familiar you can quote it. But at the end of the ministry, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I want to preach this morning, if the Lord would help me just a few minutes, on focused on the finish. Focused on the finish. It's a sad fact of life that not everyone that starts well finishes well. Oh, I wish it, wish it wasn't this, that way, but it is. It's just a fact of life. We, it, it's easier to start than it is to finish. It's like the guy I read about the other day who was trying to convince his friend that he needed to quit smoking. That's always a good thing to quit. He tried everything in the world. He said, what you need to try is hypnosis. His friend said, that's a lot of money, you know, and it takes a lot of time. Does it really work? He said, of course it does. I've done it three times now. I was talking to a friend of mine on the way down here, and he said, I've probably lost 500 pounds in my lifetime. He said, when it comes to dieting, I'm a good starter, but I'm a poor finisher. Well, it seems to be the way it is in life, isn't it? It's easy to get started, but it's a hard thing to finish. But really, it's the finish that's what matters. Jesus said that he that endureth to the end shall be saved. It was a concern of Paul in what we have read here today in those texts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when he compares the life of the Christian to a race, he he brings all of his concerns to a focal point in verse 27 when he said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself 
should be a castaway. Paul seemed to say all the way through his ministry, I'm focused on the finish. I've got my eyes on how this thing is going to end. A scripture is full of people who have a great start, but a tragic finish. I mean, you just have, you can preach the rest of the day and never get to all of them. A Samson, what a, what a start. The strongest man that ever lived, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. And then the Bible even said, he shall begin to, to deliver his people Israel. He had a great start but a bad finish. Saul was the anointed of God. A great start but at the midnight hour of his life he's on his face before a witch in Endor. It's a terrible finish. Solomon was such a wise man. What a start but what a tragic finish. What about Judas and Demas and the list goes on and on and on and on of those who had to start, but they did not finish well. And when Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 10 and talk about all the, the stops and the starts and the faults and the failures of Israel, he'd say this, and which is really Israel, that whole wilderness experience is a living illustration of, of those that start and don't finish very well. Israel would start out with a judge that, that brought them back after they come into the promised land. They would sin and a judge would bring them back and they would live for God. All of those days, oh, what a start, but it finished a different way. They're always going back and going in the wrong direction. And Paul said, these things happen unto them for our examples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. It would behoove us today to learn from these examples and focus on the finish. There's just a few things I want to preach to you about and then I'll get out of the way today. If we could get our focus on the finish, there's some things it would do to us. Number one, if we could focus on the finish, get your, your eyes off of where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. It'll make us careful in what we love. The church at Ephesus comes to mind. What a, what a start. It's a church that has so many compliments from the Savior. He looks at them. I know thy works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know that thou canst not bear them that are, are evil. I know so much about you. What a start. The apostolic church, the church so fresh and so full of, of, of Pentecost and so full of the power of the Holy Ghost. And you, you got such a great uh, potential. You got a lot going for you here. But nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left. Thy first love, the fire has begun to fade in your experience. You've got a tremendous beginning. You've got a lot of potential. But somewhere along the way, you've lost focus. And you're not, oh, you still live it, but you don't love it anymore. And that's the dying need of our age. You got people that still dress the part, that still walk the part, that still come to church, that still go through the form and the formula. Hey, you still live it, but we don't love it anymore. I say God stir up the first fire in our hearts. Stir our souls until I'm not just living it but I'm loving it. I love holiness. I love living for the Lord. I preach to my church Sunday morning. I thank God for the gospel. I thank God for a holiness preacher that put his finger in my face and said you can't go to heaven living like hell. You can't go dressing like the world and looking like the world. Oh, thank God I don't just live in church, but I still love it. I say, God, give us a revival of holy fire in this perilous hour that we are living in. Jesus said, it's the mark of the day that we're living in because iniquity doth abound. The love of many will wax cold. That's where we are. But a lukewarm church will never change a cold world. We need a church that's on fire again. We need to get our focus back on the finish. Paul said to the Galatians, you did run well. You did run well. What happened to you? Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You got your focus on the wrong things. You fell in love with the wrong things. 
uh, give me back what I've been reading in our daily devotion, Psalm 119, where the psalmist said, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. It's not just that I'm living it. Hey, I'm loving it. I love, the, I'm singing about living for God. I'm singing about the law. I'm singing about godliness. I'm singing about righteousness. I'm singing about it. I said, God, give us a church again in this hour that don't hang our head when the preacher's coming down our row. There was a day when we sung about it. We shouted about it. We worshiped with it. I want to get my focus back on the finish. I don't like the direction I'm going. I don't like what's happening. I don't like the love that's coming into my life. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love for the world is crippling the church in this hour. He need a church again. And get our love off the world and start our relationship back with Jesus Christ again. Love for the world. It caused Demas to take a detour. Now what was it? Demas had forsaken me having loved this present world. Paul said, here's what it is. He said, every man, every man that is temperate, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's comparing it to those, in our days, Olympic runners or, or athletes. They strive for the mastery. They're temperate in all things. They watch what they eat. They watch, they, they make sure that they get the right amounts of rest. Their whole life is dominated by the thought of what they're going to win. It's the discipline of desire. I've read accounts of those Olympic athletes that have started as children. And they've got their eyes focused on that one moment. And they train grueling activities. Years they spend training for that one moment. And all Paul said they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They'll govern their whole lives. They'll watch everything they do or just a chance to stand on a pedestal and somebody put a medal around their neck. They're, they're focused on the finish. When you talk to that athlete that's out before daylight jogging and running and, and putting their body through all and they're, they're going by a rigid diet, they're not talking about the, the discipline of it. It's a desire. They're focused on the finish at the end. And Paul said, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I say, God, give us a desire back. Uh, what's wrong? Uh, we got a church that's lost its desire. It's lost its focus on the finish. Uh, and now we got to prod us into worship. A uh, uh, pastor's got to prop us up. Uh, we complain about every standard. Uh, we complain about every time it comes by and preaches against our television uh, or preaches against our movies or preaches against our worldly att uh, attire and worldly entertainment. We get upset about it because uh, they've lost sight of the finish oh, but if you got a desire there's a discipline that comes with it I'm living it because I got a, a, a finish line that's on my mind I'm in love with the focus that's out there I am going to win this thing I'm doing it to win an incorruptible crown it's going to be worth it after a while hey church don't forget it'll be a day you're glad you lived holy it'll be a day you're glad that you had a hole in this preacher There'll be a day uh, that you were glad uh, that your pastor jumped down my row. Uh, he'll be glad uh, that I live for it. Uh, when I stand on that day uh, and put on an incorruptible crown, uh, I'm glad uh, I stayed focused on the finish. Number two, it'll make us careful in what we love. It'll make us cautious in where we look. Jesus said, Luke chapter 9, verse 62, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You can't plow straight rows looking over your shoulder. I remember when, when Grandpa got out, we had a tiller. I, don't, I wasn't old enough to remember the mules and horses plowing days, but I remember getting out 
And it, it wasn't one of these new rear time tillers. It was one of those old front time tillers that absolutely beats you to death, especially in hard ground. But I was a boy big enough I wanted to plow. I can turn me loose and let me do it. And I found out real quickly it was not as easy as, as Dad and Papa were making it look. And so I, I made up my mind, I'm going to plow a straight row. And so I focused my eye on that row right beside me. And then, you know, look back down my row, and you know what was going on. I'd get over here beside it, I'd pull the sheriff cat thing back, get it lined up here. And I, before I know it, I'd be over here against this one or over here that way. And finally, Grandpa would come over. Papa said, here's what you got to do, son. If you want to plow a straight row, he said, you got to fix your eye on something out there at the end of that row. You got to get your eye on what's out there at the end of that row and don't deviate from it. Lock your eye on what's out the end and plow toward it, son. I said, Lord, help me to do that in my Christian experience. You cannot plow straight. You can't live straight if you're looking to the left and you're looking to the right. That's what Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. I'm putting that behind me. You can't plow straight looking over your shoulder. You got to get your eyes fixed on something that's way out there. Something, there's a focus that's got to be out there on the finish and Paul said I press toward the mark I don't look at what's beside me I don't look at who's around me I gotta focus on the finish uh, it doesn't matter if there's a hypocrite on the pew beside me if there's a sinner on the other pew I'm not focused on what the church is doing I'm focused on the finish I'm focused I got my eyes on a prize that's out there and I'm gonna do my best if you wanna live straight and you're gonna have to focus on something that's at the end it'll keep you plowing straight in the middle you want won't go to the left or you won't go to the right uh, as long as you're looking at the world that's around you and judging yourselves among yourselves you are not wise uh, one of the easiest things to do uh, in this race of life is to get distracted uh, you get distracted by what this one's doing and what that one's doing or what they're not doing uh, and the fact that hey brother Randy preaches against that and they're doing it uh, and they're still getting on the pulpit and you get out here and you plow way over here somewhere else uh, I say leave that to brother Randy I'll take care my eyes are on the finish uh, I got a goal out there. I hope you live holy. But if you don't, my eyes are not on you. My eyes are on the prize. My eyes are on the finish. I want to be a wholeness man if nobody else around me does. I'm going to live for Jesus if my family doesn't, if my friends don't. I've got to focus. And it's not on what's sitting beside me in the pew. It's out there on the end of the race. We, we took a job when I was in high school at the ag department. We were working on re reclaiming an old abandoned mine. They hadn't done the re reclamation right. And the old rough, steep hillside. They had hired us to come in because nobody else wouldn't do it, I guess. And a bunch of teenage boys, we didn't have no more sense than to try it. But there was one thing we had to do. They had come through and that all had to be, be tilled. It all had to be disc. And we were going to have to get some lime spread in there. That thing was, it's like it is here. It's just a mountain. It was so straight up. There was no, we couldn't get a four-wheeler on it. What are we going to do? And finally, somebody said, there's an old man by the name of Bingham here on the other end of the county. He still plows with mules. I'd say he can do it. I was excited about it. I'd never seen it, you know, actually in action at that time. And we got him out of that day, and he backed his mules out and got them out there and got them all harnessed up. And then he went up, and you know what he did. Some of you old-timers, he put those blinders. What, what exactly? I knew, I thought, but what's that for? He said, because I don't want them looking. It's, it's, it's a tedious job on this hill. He said, I don't want them seeing anything but the end of a row. I don't want them seeing anything but the end. It's clear in front of them. that. They, and, and what I want their minds focused on is that if they do a good job and get back in this trailer here after a while, there's a reward coming for them. I don't want them looking at each other. I don't want them getting distracted. This one will think he's pulling harder than that one is. And so he'll get, they'll get to back and forth, trying to bite back and forth at each other and kick out of the traces because of what the other one's doing. So I'm putting the blinders on. I thought, Lord, that's what I like to do. So there's some church folks in this hour. And so they forget about who's in the traces with them but all they can focus on is if I do a good job if I can stay in the traces there's going to be a day when I stand before him and he's going to say well done thou good and faithful servant you got to be cautious in what we're looking at it'll keep us from getting distracted as John said one of the dangers of this hour was the lust of the eyes it's the history of sin in a glance sin starts with a look Eve beheld that 
fruit. She saw that the fruit was good. Uh, she got to looking, and then you're, when you start looking, it's not long before you start reaching. Uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Uh, Lot beheld uh, the well watered plains of Sodom. Uh, David saw Bathsheba bathing in the midnight. Achan saw among the, the spoils of goodly Babylonian garment. Uh, I say, God, let me do what Job said. Uh, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why uh, then said I take on a maid? Uh, I got my eyes uh, are on a prize. Uh, hey, brother, sister, I'm afraid uh, it's a lot closer and we're living it in this hour. Uh, Jesus said, I want you to know the law said you shall not commit adultery. He said, but I'm going to tell you it's closer than that. Uh, that whosoever looketh on a woman, uh, lust after her, hath committed adultery already in his heart. Uh, I say, just get focused on the finish. Uh, it'll change what you're watching. Uh, it'll change what you're reading. Uh, it'll change your entertainment. Uh, it'll change what you're doing. Uh, help me to focus on the finish. Uh, oh, I'm not doing it because the pastor said it. Uh, I'm doing it because I'm focused uh, on the finish. Uh, I want to end this thing. Uh, I want to end this thing right. What do you do? I keep my eyes fastened upon the Savior looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. He had already told them to lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher. The author and the finisher. Hey, you got to keep looking. How'd you get out of sin? How'd you get in this way? How did you get where you are today? Just looking unto Jesus. I looked unto Jesus when I was under the mire of sin. And a weight and a burden of sin. Oh, what happened when Christian looked on the cross. Uh, the weight came rolling off. Uh, oh, but I tell you what, he's the author. Uh, I looked at Jesus. Uh, he brought me out. Uh, I looked at Jesus. Uh, that's why I'm in the house of the Lord today. Uh, I looked at Jesus. Uh, he brought me out. If, oh, yes. Uh, Jesus said it. Uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, uh, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, and you know the story. Everybody that looked on the serpent, uh, they were healed. Uh, and Jesus said, that's how you're going to be healed. You Look on me. I gotta be lifted up. And I'll draw. That's how you got started. How you gonna finish? He's the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm gonna look at Jesus. I'm gonna run straight because I'm looking at him. Well, I need to hurry. If you stay focused on the finish, it'll make you careful in what you love. It'll make you cautious in where you look. It'll make you calculated. And what you lose or could lose. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse four, or chapter 14, I think it is, verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? It's a natural reaction when we're building something in this world. We got to sit down first and say, do I got enough to get this done? We built our house several years ago. That's what we had to sit down. It's what's going to cost us. And there's some things that we said, well, I'd really love to have this chandelier. I'd really love to have that. Can't do it because it's going to cost us too much. We got to get enough to finish where it's at. We've got to determine the overall cost of the endeavor. I'm focused on the finish. There's some things, all things, Paul said, are lawful, but not all things are expedient for me. I got to finish. There's some things that I cannot say are sin. There's some things I cannot give you. Scripture in verse 4. It's like I told my church the other night. But I can't do it. I cannot go there. It's not expedient for me. I, I'm afraid if I spend there, I won't have enough to finish the race. So I want you to know finishing the race is more important to me uh, than the, the, the luxury and the ease that I have in getting there. Satan is a slick salesman. He never shows you the price tag up front. He always he tries to keep men focused on the pleasures and not the cost. Uh, uh, nobody would buy in. If he did, I mean, who would buy? 
eternal damnation? Who would buy destruction of the soul? Who would buy death? Who would buy devastation? And nobody wants to buy that kind of stuff. So he wraps it all up in pleasures and keeps you distracted from the finish. Christ didn't come to be a salesman. He came to be a savior. And the cost is always up front. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I'm keeping my focus on the finish. I realize it's going to cost me if I sin. I realize it's going to cost me. There's a cross that's out there and it'll cost me to live right. Oh, but if you can focus on the finish, you can be like Paul was in Philippians chapter 3. He said, but what things are gain of me, those I counted loss. Those I counted loss of Christ. He said, I got my eye on a prize. I laid down my education. I laid down my social upbringing. I put aside everything that I had. I laid aside my formal religion that was lost that I might win cross or win Christ. Hey, do you remember what it was when you got saved? You said, anything I can lay down if I can just win Christ. They didn't have to preach against it. They just had to hint. And you laid it down and sucked it off. Because I want to win Christ. But now we got got older and we've got colder and the race has got weary. What happened to Paul? Paul's been through some hardship now. He's been through shipwreck. He's been stoned. He's been beaten. He said at the beginning, those things that were gained to me, I counted them a loss. He said, but verse 8, yes, doubtless and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ he said I counted but I want you to know as an old man I still count I still say it's worth it I still say that living for Jesus Christ is worth it all a focus on the finish is what motivated Moses by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer. Well, you can't get people to want to do anything like that in this day and age. If the air conditioner goes out, we did. I know I've been there. We got four. We had a service show. Not only one of them was working. People complaining. This is my last year. My goodness. Suffer. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses, on one hand, is all of Egypt. The treasures, the pleasures of Egypt. It's out here. It's it, We have people today that are selling out for far less than what Moses had. I've got everything that Egypt can offer me. It's on, one, on the other hand, it's suffering, affliction, bondage, stripes, taunting, teasing. It's, 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 it's all on this side. How do you make that choice, Moses? How do you do it? Because you've got to focus on the finish. And when you focus on the finish, you'll realize that the world... And all its pleasures are overrated. Verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 11 said, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. How'd you do it, Moses? I was focused on the finish. It looked good right now. Right now, Egypt looks good. Right now, Egypt's got the upper hand. Right now, Egypt seems like the place to be. But that's not how it's going to end. Moses climbed up and looked down the road. He said, I see a suffering people right now. But I see a glorious Savior coming to them. I see a day and they're going to come out. And he said, I'd rather suffer for a moment and reign forever as enjoy the moment and suffer forever. That's what we got to do, saints of God. You're selling out too cheap. You're selling out too cheap. I said you're selling out too cheap. Look down the road. She may look beautiful right now. Look how this thing's going to end. It may look fun right now. Look how it's going to end. Get your focus on the finish. 
Paul said, for our light affliction. Uh, he's talking about a guy that's been just talked about. I ain't talking about a guy that's not in the clique. Because he wasn't. I ain't, talk, I ain't talking about a guy that's stoned, left for dead, a day and a night in the deep, shipwrecks, perils of robbers, perils of my own. People in church didn't even like me. I'm switching churches because there's people there that don't like me. You get over that if you get focused on the finish. Paul said, but for our light affliction, which is before a moment, worketh for us. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul said, if you get focused on the finish, it's not just glory. It's heavy glory. Oh, God. It's not just glorious. It's going to be greatly glorious at the end. For I reckon, Paul said, I've added it all up at reckon in Romans 8 and 18. That is, Brother Charles, he's a wordsmith. But from what I can study, Brother Charles, that's a mathematical word. That means I've added it all up. I reckon I've added all this up. I've weighed it up. I've tallied it out. I've done all the equations. I've added everything together. And this is what I come up with. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. How you doing it, Paul? I added it all up. And I said, heaven going to be worth the journey at a while. I said, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. I need to close. One more thing. One more thing. If you can get focused on the finish, it will. It'll make you careful in what you love. It'll make you cautious in where you look. It'll make you calculated in the losses. But here's the number one thing focusing on the finish will do for you today. It'll do for us here today. It will make us comfortable in how we leave. Oh, God. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. When Paul picks up the pen to write Timothy, Paul knew this is the last letter I'm ever going to write. These are the final words. Just any day, I'm going to get the call. Just any day, Nero's going to have his way. And yet when he comes to verse 6, he said, For I am now ready to be off. I'm fixing to die. But isn't it amazing the guy that's focused on the finish, death is not a tragedy. It's an offering. I am now ready to be offered. I've given my life. Now I'm going to give him my death. The last act of worship that I can give God is to go out singing, is to go out in glory, to go out with his name on my lips. He is focused on the finish, and death is not a tragedy. Death is one final act of worship. Timothy, I want you to know I am now ready to be offered. I've preached it. My life has been a sacrifice, and I am ready to pour out the remaining drops of my flesh and blood on an altar of sacrifice. Oh, it may look like a chop block, but for me it's an altar. What are you doing, Paul? What a tragedy to be cut down in your prime. No, I'm focused on the finish. Therefore, I'm absolutely comfortable with the way I am leaving. I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. That word departure paints three pictures in the Greek. Number one, it was a ship that was hoisting the anchor. It had been anchored in a troubled harbor for a long time. Paul said, Timothy, uh, the anchor's being weighed right now. The time of my departure is at hand. I'm about to break bands uh, with a world uh, of sin and sorrow. I'm about to sail uh, to unknown seas. Uh, and I'm sailing with my captain. Uh, the time uh, of my departure is at hand. Uh, I've lived my life uh, all this moment. Uh, I've lived my life. Uh, uh, bring me to this place. Um, and the ship uh, is about to leave harbor. Or it's an army uh, that was breaking up camp. Uh, the time of our departure is at hand. Uh, we've been ensconced here. Uh, we've been fighting here. Uh, the fight's over. The battle's won. The time is time to break up camp. It's time to break up camp. 
it's time to return or it's the unyoking of a beast of burden at the end of the day the time of the departure is to lay off the yoke is to take off that restriction is to lay off the yoke oh the time of my departure is at hand I've been bound I've been it's been a hard battle it's been a wicked fight but it's almost over yes it's almost over I'm about to break the yoke and leave this for a heavenly climb it's not the frantic words of a panicked man. I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. It's been a fight, but it's been a good fight. Because I'm fighting for a good captain. And I'm fighting for a good cause. I have fought a good fight. Timothy, I have finished my course. This is where I intended to be at this moment. I didn't know where it would be, but I, I had a pretty good idea how it would be. I finished. I finished. I finished. I finished it. Oh my God, that's what I'm waiting on. I finished. Oh yes, I know we're in the toiling part right now. We're in the trying part right now. But they're coming today saying, oh God, when I'm going to finish this course. They've been things in this course that I have not understood. They've been tests in this course that I have not done so well at. But I've stayed on the course. I'm staying on the course. And I want to come down to the end. I'm focused on the finish. And when I get to that day, I have finished my course. I may not lived up to your standard. I may not lived up to your approval. But I want to be able to look him in the eye and say, I finished my course. I've done what you asked me to do, Lord. I've come down. Paul now has got this is where I was going uh, way back in the beginning at our first verse in Acts uh, and Paul looks at none of these things move me uh, I got a course in mind uh, I got to finish my course uh, I'm not going to get distracted uh, I'm not going to get upset because uh, they won't make me part of the church uh, I'm not going to get upset because uh, a brethren at Jerusalem uh, would rather me preach somewhere else uh, I'm not I'm going to finish my course uh, my course may not be through Jerusalem uh, it may be in parts of the world uh, that nobody's ever seen in on before at the gospel and I'm going to finish my course I want to stay with it and Paul comes down now and said Timothy I did it Timothy I did it I finished my course it's forth that's where it's at it's forth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness hey it's a Lord the righteous judge so give me at that day and not to me only but to all them also that love is appearing uh, it's forth uh, that day uh, that day's what I'm living for but Charles that day's what I'm fighting for uh, that day uh, when the Lord uh, said well done uh, how good and faithful servant I'm fixing to close Brother Frank Shaney Felt most of you have never met Brother Frank some of you met Brother Steve his son pastors and down Gadsden, Alabama, Hoax Bluff. Just a few years ago, we got acquainted with Brother Frankie. He was a character. Had me. He just, uh, he, he just absolutely brutally honest. If you didn't want to know, Brother Mike, what, what Brother Frankie thought, you didn't ask Brother Frankie. He just, uh, just, uh, uh, he just refreshing in, in, a, in an hour when everybody's politically correct. Go see Brother Frankie because he just, he's a, a Christian man, loved the Lord, had been a, a, a wild and wicked man in his early age, quite a talented musician. But he had worked, in, and Frankie had, had worked in, uh, I don't know if it was the asbestos that called it, caused it, or, but he, he had worked in, as a stonemason and worked in around some, some, some things in his life. I'm not sure what caused, caused it, but he came down, Brother Frankie had been sick. And, and they, they called the family in. They'd, they'd checked him. There was some spots in his lungs. And, and Brother Steve and the other brothers had gathered into the, the room with them. And they called, the, the doctor called a family meeting to go over what he had found. And the biopsies were back in and whatever that stuff is. The, all the tests had come back. And he said, all right. I, I, I regret to, and, and the doctor's a Muslim. And he said, I regret to inform you, Mr. Shaney Felt, you have inoperable lung cancer I was quiet in the room and 
Brother Frank said, all right, how long? How long, how long have I got? The doctor said, I'd rather not talk about that right now. I mean, I'd rather just let the shock of all this settle in. And he kind of glancing around the family. And Brother Steve said, if he wants to know, you need to tell him. He said, weeks, perhaps months, not very long. All right? Okay. That's all I need to know. No tears, no panic. And the Muslim doctor came back and said, Mr. Shaney, do you understand what I'm telling you right now? He said, I understand that I've got a few weeks to live, maybe months to live. The doctor was just overwhelmed. He said, all these years, I've been in America 12 years now, I've never seen anything like this. I've seen grown men cry, I've seen them collapse, I've seen families fall apart. This beats anything that, that, that I've ever seen. And these are the words that Frank Shaney felt said to that Muslim doctor. He said, doctor, several years ago, I got ready for this moment. Several years ago, I got ready for this day. I didn't know when this day would come, but I got ready for it. And these are the words that I, I, I've repeated over and over again. Brother Frank said to that Muslim doctor, he said, Sir, if you live right, you can die right. If you live right, you can die right. I'm focused on the finish. I'm living right because I intend on dying right. You can't, you can't die right if you don't live right. But if you live right, you can die. That Muslim doctor said later on, he talked to the CEO of the hospital. He didn't know that the CEO of the hospital was, was Brother Steve Shaney Felt's uh, uh, sister, he, or his wife's sister. And he didn't know that. He didn't know her, her sister-in-law, however the story went. He didn't know, but he went to that and said, I've never seen anything like it. I've been in America for 12 years. I didn't think there was any genuine faith in America. He said, I did not believe that, that there was any faith in America at all. He said, but I have met a family that lets me know that there are still some people in America who have an absolute faith in God. He said, I've never met anything like this. They're not afraid to die. It's completely fixed. He said, I didn't realize it was here, but it is. I want you to know faith is still alive and well in this hour. And if you live right, you can die right. My Aunt Edna came down to die. She came down 18 years. She'd gotten saved at my grandma's funeral, lived a rough life. And because of that, things were in her life that she dealt with. And, and she came down and, and she knew it was the end. And she talked to me. She said, I want you to preach a year before she died, Brother Andy. She'd been saved 17 years. And she said this to me. She said, Brent, I want you to preach my funeral. This is what I want you to do. I said, I want you to preach to my lost family. I want you to preach to my, my children. But I don't want any tears. I don't want you after that. I want you to, to preach about the grace of God. I want you to preach about heaven. I want you to preach. And I said, Ed, no, I don't want to talk about this right now. This is morbid. I, don't, I was driving her down the road. And she said, no, it ain't. I tears coming down. She said, don't cry, son. 17 years ago, I got ready for this moment. This is what I'm living for. This is what I'm preparing for. Don't sorrow over me as those that had no hope. I know where I'm going. That's what I'm trying to do, saints of God. Where's your focus at today? It's on the finish. I want to come down to that day. No regrets. No remorse. No rebuke. And he looks across and said, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Would you lift your hands today? Give God the glory.